Hello, everyone. All right, folks in the back, come on up. I won't bite. Come on, take a seat. I promise it will be worth your while. I'm leaving town tomorrow, so even if it, I don't make the promise, it won't matter. Um, so a little bit about my background, and then we'll get into what I'm going to talk about today. So I was at Microsoft about 14 years. I started in 1987. I'm one of the few people who managed to have material roles on some of the biggest products, many of the biggest products we've had. I was the first marketing leader for Microsoft Office. I ran uh, development and marketing in the whole business for MS-DOS. I ran the launch of Windows 95. I went back to Windows, got recruited back to Windows and uh, ran some of Windows 98 and Windows 2000. I ran a bunch of our internet initiatives, either marketing or overall, Internet Explorer stuff. And then my last job, I was called in to run and revitalize MSN. It was an amazing career, really fortunate that I had those opportunities. And I'll be glad to answer lots of questions about Microsoft at the end. But I'm not really going to talk about Microsoft a lot today. I'm going to talk about this. And to get this going, I'm going to ask you a question. But before I do that, uh, a couple housekeeping things. You have name tags, but I can't read them all. So if you'll, because uh, there's a lot of audience participation in this, it's, it's kind of a discussion as well as me, me speaking. So if, you, if, I, if I call on you or you speak out, tell me who you are. I'll try to remember that. I won't necessarily because I'm not great with names. But tell me who you are, maybe you know, one brief sentence about what company you're with or you know, you're, you know, you're seeking to find the perfect partner at Rev1 or whatever you're doing, OK? Sound fair? You ready to rock and roll? Yeah. All right. Let's start with a question, if I can get this to work. Let's see. Oh, that's weird. Let's try it one more time. There we go. What is most important to the success of a business leader? Who's going to start? Go ahead. Your name? Alex. Alex. So, you have to do the success of the people working under him. The success of the people working under him or her. Okay, what else? Good accessories. I'm sorry? Good accessories. Go yeah, cool. Okay. to establish sustainable management systems. All of you are leaders in one way. You should have some thinking about this. What else? Go ahead. Listening. Collaborating. Collaborating. Good. What else? What's your name? Ryan. Ryan. Effective, communication. Effective communication. All right, I'm going to pick on someone in the back, just because you're hanging out back there. What's your name in the blue sweater? Jen? Establishing priorities. Establishing priorities. OK. You represent the entire back, so there was no pressure on you. OK. Establishing priorities. What else? Anything else anybody want to raise? Yes. Carla. Carla? Inspiring, motivating. Inspiring, motivating. Good. OK. Those are all good answers. Now I'm going to tell you that none of you got the right answer. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of fun. The most important part of the success of any business leader is strategy. Everything you said is important. But if you're inspiring and your company strategy is wrong, you'll be inspiring the wrong thing. You won't be successful. You could have great process and great priorities. All these things are, I get every time. I've given this speech countless times, countless times, and no one's ever said strategy in the audience. And I've given this to CEOs and senior executives and business students and incubators. Last incubator I went to was a big one in Chicago. And no one ever answered strategy. Think about that for a second, right? All you are running business, if your success depends on a great strategy. But what is strategy? Hold your question, and we'll get back to that. What do you think strategy is? 
The allocation of resources. What else? Knowing what the end goal is. Good. I forgot your name. You told me to. Kim. Kim. Kim says the allocation of resources. I mean, Kim says the. Wow, I need, a, I need a memory. That would be help me. Okay, anything else? Doesn't it have to be a successful strategy? I've seen a lot of really stupid strategies. Yeah, <laughs> of course it has to be a successful strategy. That's what I throw that out. Yeah. It's Just like this has to be a successful talk. <laughs> okay, so at a very basic level, strategy is your plan to compete. And your plan to compete always involves making bets. Every day you make bets. I was talking to someone here who's working on a, on a sort of a, a medical uh, bet, right, uh, related to, to biologics and a bunch of stuff I don't know a lot about. But they're making a bet that they could have these antibodies work and, and reduce disease, right? So I was talking to someone else here, and they're doing a dashboard for for basically sustainability and looking at all the energy resources in your company, right? And whether or not they can be successful depends on how that bet goes. Now, most of the time when you're making a bet, you're making one principal bet. I mean, you make lots of bets, but generally a company is founded on one or two principal bets. And so I'm going to talk about now Two of the biggest, most successful bets in the history of business. And this is the Microsoft part, okay? In 1975, Bill Gates and Paul Allen founded Microsoft. And their, their mission was to take advantage of the PC. They were betting on the success of the PC. Now back then, and I could see that there are some people here who were around, the PC was just a hobbyist tool. Not a lot of people used it. But they believed that they, could, they would see a day when there was a PC on every desk, on in every home running Microsoft software. And their first foray, foray into that was languages. And they were very successful with PC languages like BASIC. Now, the big player in tech at that time was, anybody want to say? IBM. Excellent. And IBM was known for mainframe computers. So the PC continued to grow, and IBM said, oh, I got to get in that business. And they decided they wanted to get in that business in one year, which for a bureaucratic company like IBM was a very big undertaking. In fact, if I recall, they went to a place, not like this exactly, but they went off site, they created a new group, and they, they worked very hard to distance themselves from the bureaucracy of IBM. To build a PC in one year required they use off-the-shelf components and licensed software. So they went to Microsoft and they said to Microsoft, hey, would you be able to license us some software for our PC? My water here is for a second. Um, and Microsoft said, I have one open one somewhere. Oh, here it is. Okay, Microsoft said, sure, we'd love to license you languages. But they said, what about an operating system? And Bill Gates said, well, we don't really do operating systems. The place to go is this company called Digital Research. And the guy who runs it is a guy named Gary Kildall. Go visit Gary, and Gary will give you, basically work with you and sell you CPM. So they set up a meeting. IBM flew down to the Bay Area to meet with Gary Kildall. The only problem was Gary didn't show up went flying on a private plane with a friend and skipped the IBM meeting. True story. They met with his wife. They had some discussions. IBM was upset because the CEO didn't show up. They did have some discussions, though, and they couldn't reach an agreement for digital research to customize CPM for IBM in their one-year time frame. So Microsoft went back, got another visit from IBM, and IBM said, can you help us? Paul Allen knew a company in Seattle that made a product called 86DOS. And Bill Gates went to IBM and said, this product can be customized for you. Do you want to buy it or should we? And IBM said, we don't know anything about PC software. We only know mainframe software. 
So you buy it. So for $50,000 and change, I'm not kidding, Microsoft bought 86 DOS and turned it into MS DOS. And they gave it away to IBM for free, but retained the rights to license it to every other PC manufacturer. So when the IBM PC came out, shortly thereafter came out Dell and Compaq and Gateway and every other PC clone manufacturer, and Microsoft licensed MS-DOS to every one of them. A billion dollar business was born. Microsoft's bet on the PC led to a bet on languages, led to a bet on operating systems that led to a billion dollar business and a little bit of luck and timing in between. Amazing story. Now, I came to the company in 1987, and by then, Microsoft was already working on applications because they realized that while the operating system was a huge business, people doing word, using word processors and spreadsheets and all that stuff was a really big business as well. The problem was that in the MS-DOS days, Microsoft wasn't the leader in applications. Who's heard of WordPerfect? Oh. Now, when I present to MBA classes, no hands go up. Who's heard of Lotus 1, 2, 3? Same thing. MBA classes, I don't get a single hand. So it's really refreshing to be here. <laughs> uh, so these products were dominant, and they, they had a learning curve. Remember, MS-DOS was a character-based operating system, and these products, you know, you had to hit slash and, you know, all these. <laughs> this person, what's your name? Brian, I think, is getting a headache just thinking about it. So you... You can't imagine that, or you can remember that those products, once you learn them, you didn't really want to switch. And so Microsoft, with its spreadsheet multiplan or its word processor Word, would try to add features but wasn't getting anywhere. So they had to figure out what's the strategy to win? What's the bet to make to be successful and beat these guys? And they had decided to bet on this, GUI. Who knows what GUI stands for? All right, go ahead. Graphical user interface. Bill, right? Was it Bill? Yes. Yeah. Bill says graphical user interface. Ah, this mic drives me bananas. So that's correct. You passed Go Collect 200. Nice job. Okay, so the bet was that if we can get people to switch to Windows, they're going to make such a big switch with that, then they'll be open-minded to switching to applications at the same time. Because then the learning curve they're going through anyway. That was the bet. Now, you have to understand, back then, that was a huge, huge bet. Because in 1987, Windows was a horrible product. And the second version of Windows, which came out in December of 87, was also a horrible product. So you were betting the company. In poker terms, you were going all in. Any poker players in the audience? Yeah, a few. All right, you've gone all in? All right, you've gone all in. Microsoft was going all in. They were not only betting on applications business on moving to Windows, but remember they had this billion dollar MS-DOS business. And they were basically betting that that business would convert to Windows. A huge, gigantic, risky bet. Core strategic bet. And I think you all know what happened. In the 90s, 1990 Windows 3.0 came out, in 91, 3.1 came out, 95 came out, in 1995, and that was the one that really ushered Windows into the mainstream. Before and after Windows 3.0 and 3.1, Microsoft came out with versions of its applications, the spreadsheet now called Excel, Word for Windows, add, they added PowerPoint, and they came out with product, those products in those years. And they combined them into Microsoft Office. Meanwhile, WordPerfect, didn't do a Windows version of WordPerfect until 92, and it wasn't very good. Lotus 123 never did a Windows version of their product, a full Windows version of their product. So in the end, with good products and competitor missteps, Microsoft dominated the applications business as well. They took $1 billion business, MS-DOS, and replaced it with another multi, two multi-billion uh, dollar businesses, Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows. They made two bets, a bet on the PC 
and a bet on GUI. At the core of their strategy, and both paid off big time. So the lesson is that your strategy is all about making bets. And once you make your bets, like Microsoft did, you've got to be aggressive about it. Plan your attack and attack your plan. But the question is, how do you decide what bets to make? The formula I'm now going to talk about with you, the model, is inspired by the most famous equation in the world, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, E equals mc squared. And I am going to talk instead about E times mc squared, what I call the strategic theory of relativity. Now, what I talk to you about in the next few minutes is not designed to give you answers. It's a model. It's designed to help you think about strategy and how to build successful strategies. Success still requires Brian's ingenuity and Kim's smarts and Ed's intuition. You still have to have all the right intelligence to make the right moves. But the model will help you think about it. Okay, so let's go through the model. Understanding it, applying it, and using it. E times MC squared. We'll start with understanding it. Okay, E times MC squared, the C stands for customer value. The most important part of most strategies is customer value. What value are you providing your customers? And it's squared because it's the most important part. The M stands for market potential. Market potential at its base level is how much money can you make? And that's influenced by many, many things. For example, market size. Sometimes you could have a few customers and a large price and you could get a good market, but most of the times you're looking for a large market with a lot of customers. There's that plane again. You gotta be able to reach your customers. That also is a determinant of market potential. Competition. Who's this? The MBAs all get this. This is WhatsApp. Anybody know what they sold to Facebook for? $19 billion. Someone said 18, basically 18, 19 billion dollars. I think Brian said that. Now, I bring them up, and these next guys, who's this? Snapchat. You know what their market cap is? It's about 12 billion, I think. And they went public over 20, I think. These guys don't make any money. I bring them up only to say that sometimes in the tech world, and maybe in the medical world, I'm not as familiar with it, your market potential in the short and medium term is not necessarily determined by how much money you make. It's determined by other things, like the number of customers you have. And this E stands for execution. Execution is basically everything you do every day to run your business. Operations, coding, marketing, financial planning. Everything you do every day to run your business, that's execution. Now, some people will say execution is not strategic. But nothing could be further from the truth. What did I say strategy was? Your plan to compete. Work with me, work with me, okay? If it's your plan to compete and you, and you execute and that's how you compete, then execution is a key part of strategy. There's three different types of execution that I'm gonna talk about today. Strategic execution are ways you use execution strategically to compete. I wanna have a better sales force. I'm gonna outmarket you. I'm going to have better partnerships, so on. Customer value execution are things you do to achieve higher customer value. I want to design a better product so I have better customer value. The key part of my product is it has a higher quality than somebody else, so I have to execute on the quality to achieve the customer value, and so forth. And lastly, there's financial execution. And these are all the things that I list here that help you increase your profits, and your market potential. 
Now, if you look closely, you'll see that things fall in multiple buckets. It's not surprising. One of the reasons someone said in the very beginning people are so important is because you need great people to build your strategy in the first place, but you need great people for financial execution, for strategic execution, for customer value execution. Manufacturing helps with financial execution, but also helps with customer value. And so things fall into multiple buckets. So that gives you an overview. The E stands for? The M stands for? And the C stands for? Customer value. Okay, in summary. Strategy is preeminent to successful leadership. And your strategy is about making bets. Your strategy, your plan to compete is about making bets. And the model I gave you today to help you think about how to build winning strategies and make the right bets is E times MC squared, the strategic theory of relativity. The E stands for? Execution. Execution. The M stands for? Market potential. Market potential. There's three types. Anybody remember what they were? Strategic? Customer value and financial. And the C stands for customer value. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to maximize E times MC squared relative to the competition. The winning strategy ideas I gave you, anybody remember those? Seek change, mind the gap. But remember, what am I going to say? It's all relative. OK, that's the strategic theory of relativity. I can now do Q&A. Thank you very much.